Welcome, everybody. We have about 41 people on the call, which is awesome. Thanks for joining. Uh, I hope we can live up to your expectations for this session. Uh, what we have done is instead of having a big joint lecture or lecture kind of a thing where we just talk about the problems and what the solutions might be, we would like to hear more from you and um, get and maybe share our whatever we know as per your questions. Um, so what we have designed for this session is that I will just do a quick intro and then we have many of these people whose names you see uh, on the slide who are subject matter experts in their area. They will talk a little bit about their, uh, their area and how to debug and what they see with the telco and other things happening. And then we will leave enough time in the end for question and answers. And that way we are targeting what, what your problems are and what you see. And we go from there. So for introductions, my name is Rashid Khan. Uh, I help out with the networking team in RHEL and in OpenShift and work closely with uh, other people like Neutron team and other stuff. You might have heard of me, been here at Red Hat for about nine years. And um, recently I've been spending a lot of time with the uh, telco. I've been uh, working towards one large telco deployment and uh, making sure things are uh, working out fine over there. And I completely understand and agree uh, that debugging this, debugging stuff for telco is becoming more and more of a problem. And uh, this is a slide that uh, usually Marco, uh, Marco from the support team, he shares that we have created a system which is awesome, but it looks more and more like a cockpit of a space shuttle. He started off with the cockpit of a 747, Boeing 747, but now he has upgraded his, his slide to have a cockpit of uh, uh, the space shuttle. And debugging this requires a lot of, uh, a lot of, debugging this requires a lot of skills. Right. We understand that, we appreciate it, and we are trying to solve it. So what we want to do is, we have a panel of experts. They will go over their areas of expertise, as I mentioned, in TCP, NetFilter, OBS, DPDK, OVN, Network Manager, NM State, and EBPF XDP. So we'll try to give you a preview about all of this stuff. And, and we wanted to also tell you that more help is on the way. Uh, we have been talking about helping with debuggability, observability for a very, very long time. But I'm happy to report that now there is an open source project which uh, is coming top down or, or bottom up, depends on how you look at it, from OpenShift side and all the way down to RHEL. And we have our team members, one, one team member fully dedicated to it, and uh, other people are helping part time to that effort. In addition to that, uh, there is a dedicated team of people and architects and stuff on the OpenShift side. And I think everybody will benefit from that project and uh, they have plans and we can tell you more about it if you are interested of what they plan to do. More important to that is that if you have a wish list of, hey, I wish I could debug this such and such way or I was debugging it, I, I had a problem and I couldn't find a solution for such and such thing, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. We will put it on the wish list and we'll work with you to try to solve the problem and make it part of this network observability project. With that said, um, I will give the mic to Paolo and Paolo can tell us more about TCP UDP and other things. Go ahead. Hello. So let's have a look first at uh, core networking protocols. Uh, the good thing about UDP and TCP especially, is that they are quite stable and we don't usually see uh, functional issues with them, but um, we can still observe, or at least uh, reported quite a few of performance-related uh, uh, problems. MPTCP is a quite different beast instead because it's uh, very, very new. It's uh, just landed in the new major release of RHEL 
and even upstream is uh, quite new. Um, so it's a completely different gauntlet. We had a, a specific presentation about MPTSP and hands-ons on it, and I suggest all the interested people to have a look at it. Uh, it's linked in the slides. Um, regarding uh, TCP and uh, especially UDP and the UDP forwarding pack, we are reported uh, more often than not uh, some um, performance issues, performance not up to the user expectations. And it's not always simple to uh, guess a possible root cause, especially when the network deployment is extremely complex, like a containerized one, and the workload around on top of it is unknown and huge. Uh, anyhow, there is a great tool that is bundled out of the kernel binaries, which is called PATH, which can be used in a very handy way, and it's uh, very useful to detect uh, bottlenecks in uh, even in live, live system, even in system running critical tasks, the tool can be executed with very limited impact on the system itself and the in execution workload and collect data and can be analyzed offline and can easily identify which uh, part of the kernel is spending most CPU cycles. Um, in the case of uh, UDP forwarding path, that usually is due to the lack of bulking, that is lack of GRO, GSO for the forwarding uh, packets, forwarded packets. And that is a situation which uh, has no easy solution, no um, silver bullet, uh, but things are improving in that area recently because uh, a new set of GRO functionality for forwarding uh, Packets has been introduced in the upstream kernel and the portal to RHEL, and we are in the road to support that even for um, UDP encapsulated traffic on top of UDP tunnel. And that's it for uh, UDP, TCP, and PTSP. So I will uh, give the speaker the microphone to the next presenter thanks paolo uh, and uh, for the audience everybody will be available to answer your questions so paolo is not going away uh, he's going to be around in the end also if you have specific questions in this area moving along to net filter um eric hello all right so i have a few things here about net filter um first topic uh is nf tables um, this first bullet here is really just kind of a primer about NF tables in general. This is uh, on the Red Hat blog. Um, notably, NF tables is where we are spending most of our development effort now uh, in regards to firewalling. Uh, so that's why it's uh, highlighted here. Um, some of the major uh, advantages or reasons for that are because we can do combined IPv4 and IPv6 processing. Um, I think that's one of the an important point in regards to telco. Um, the other uh, big benefit would be it has a pretty efficient set and map implementation. Um, one of the more powerful things is uh, the concept of vertex maps where you can, uh, it's basically a giant set that you can, you know, match a certain IP address or something and then you can drop or reject based on that. And that's all based on the set. So it's a single, single rule uh, in the rule set, but it's a set that you can add to dynamically that uh, determines what actually happens to the traffic. Um, in regards for debugging NF tables, uh, so NF tables has a pretty uh, pretty good tracing tool, and how it works is you add a rule in the rule set that sets this uh, this meta NF trace set one. And the cool thing about this is I can 
quant qualify this with uh, packet criteria. So like I can match a certain IP address or a certain TCP port and enable tracing only for a subset of traffic. And then when I have that model set, I can just run empty monitor and see all the events. And events you can see are like packet drops, you know, jumps to different trains or packets that are being accepted. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty cool uh, tool for uh, debugging a rule set. Uh, second item on the list here is IP tables. And the only bullet point here I have is uh, basically migrate to NF tables if you can, when you can. Um, this link here is actually a blog, or I believe it's uh, an access article about uh, how to go about doing that migration. Um, the, the short summary is there is a tool called IP Tables Translate that is specifically for, uh, you know, you feed in IP Tables rules and it tries to spit out a NF Tables equivalent rule. Uh, last item here is Firewall D. Um, the uh, notable thing in regards to Telco is the last item there is uh, the concept of policy objects was just recently implemented upstream. Uh, this basically just adds out, uh, full output and forward filtering to Firewall D. Um, for debugging Firewall D, uh, there's a global option called set log denied that just you can use to basically catch anywhere a packet gets dropped. Um, it can go further down to just multicast or broadcast or whatever, uh, but in general, you can just log anytime, and that just goes to dmessage log. Um, alternatively, uh, FireWallD is backed by NF tables, so you can go use full NF tables tracing if you really want to, um, and that's what we as developers often do. So yeah, um, that's all I have about NetFilter. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Flavio, you are up next. Hello. I'm going to talk a little bit about OVS. And when I say OVS here, I mean the DPDK accelerated open vSwitch, which is that data path that runs entirely in user space. So let's go to bullet, uh, the first bullet in features. Um, this is a nice one that improves performance, which is important for telco deployments. Um, well, basically, uh, the, the network cards today, they are capable of receiving uh, tens or hundreds of million packets per second. And uh, that is uh, too much to process on a single CPU core. So the network card helps to scale in this by applying a hashing algorithm to each receiving packet and then distribute the packets to into queues. And then we can create user space threads to process those queues, right? So we have this nice parallel distribution of the workload. However, depending on the receiving traffic pattern, we might have a thread that is really busy while others are not uh, doing, uh, doing much. So this first bullet here is about have, uh, enabling open vSwitch to detect that situation, that unbalanced uh, workload situation, and redistribute the queues or ports to try to make the, the load balance uh, between the threads again. Um, this is important for two things. Uh, one is that it avoids the throughput issue when you, you know when the CPU becomes the bottleneck, and also to avoid the spurious packet drops because as the thread approaches the maximum processing capacity, uh, the, the chances of dropping packets increases. And then let's go now for the second bullet the user space TCP segmentation of load. It's also known as TSO. So in this case, it's also to improve performance. Um, the idea here is that instead of the virtual machine sends uh, 20, 30, or 40 uh, TCP packets and then uh, to the data path, and then the data path has to process all these packets, and then finally forward to the network card, we offload uh, this to the final stage, which is the network card. So uh, the virtual machine can send one big packet up to 64 kilobytes. And then this packet will go, ju just one packet will go to the data path. It's a lot cheaper to process one packet. And then we leave to the network card to split these packets into regular uh, network sizes. Um, so saves a lot of CPU cycles here. 
we are talking about three times more performance, five times more performance, or depending on the how you connect things, it can go up to eight times more performance. Now, moving to debugging tools, I selected here three tools which I think are essential to know if you are working with OBS. The first one is tracing packets inside of OpenVSwitch. Uh, it's a programmable data path, so and the, the flow tables is is uh, becoming bigger and complex to follow. This tool allows you to provide a packet and then trace what would happen inside of the data path. So it's really a hand, uh, it's really useful to understand what's going on. The next tool is about logging. OVS provides a logging facility, which is really uh, it's interesting because you can set different levels. Uh, for different pieces of uh, OVS. So if you are more interested in a certain uh, specific area, you can enable the debug just on that, on that area. Other areas, you can even hide messages or increase the, the, the log message level to hide those messages. You know, when you enable too much messages, there are performance uh, impact, but in you know, doing so, you, you still can see the log messages without having to rebuild or change the software at the production side. And the last bullet is about showing coverage counters. Uh, these counters are basically event counters. So OVS keeps a, a large set of event counters. And when you use that common, you will see uh, the, the, the rate of changings uh, over the last uh, seconds or the last minute or even in the last hour. So it's nice to understand, to see what's going on with OVS with those comments. All right, I think I covered all the slides. That's what I had for open usage. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to come talk to you about uh, OBN now. So, um, OBN, uh, I'll focus more in this slide about the whole debugging and um, debugging aids as opposed to, say, relevance to telco, because in general, OBN is a method for describing logical networks and the result of OBN's output is OBS. Um, and so OBS then actually takes care of any of the data plane um, things that OBN programs. So therefore, everything that you use OBS for, you can use in an OBN deployment as well. You just might have multiple OBS, multiple servers running OBS or multiple containers running OBS as a result. Um, but what you end up with when you use OVN is that there may be some sort of questions linking what you see from OBS versus what you initially programmed into OVN. So um, one of the things you might find yourself doing is saying, you know, oh, I can't ping uh, between these two VMs. So why is that going wrong? Well, we have a few tools that can help you to debug connectivity. So um, first things first. Um, one of the things you can do with OVN that's a well-documented feature is listing logical flows that OVN creates. But it can be sometimes hard to link those to the open flow that OVS ends up creating. So with these options here given to the L flow list command for OVN SBCTL, specifically this hyphen hyphen V flow and hyphen hyphen OVS, um, it'll actually show the resulting OVS open flow pro, um, flows that get created based off of the logical flows in OVN. So that's sort of a step one you can use. Um, another thing you can do is use something called OVN Trace. OVN Trace is a really cool program that will allow for you to describe a simulated packet and put it you know, into an OVN logical data path. And the OVN Trace will then show what logical flows get hit by that packet and where the packet will end up going uh, in the logical network. So you can see, for instance, if you've defined, say, an ACL that drops a packet that you didn't mean to do or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, you saw Flavio talked on the previous slide about the OVS app control OF proto trace. Um, well, you can actually link that to a program in OVN called OVN dtrace. And what that will do is it'll take the packet that you simulated going through OVS and it'll actually translate that into the logical flows that OVN programs. So you can sort of see um, which logical switches or logical routers are being traversed uh, by the packet. So in addition to connectivity commands, um, what you may find is that status uh, commands are useful to have because um, OVN can spread across multiple servers. And if you're using multiple uh, 
database connected with Raft, then knowing what the current status of the system is is pretty useful. Um, so here are just a couple of commands that you can use. The first one is just for OVN controller. All it does is just simply tell you if it's connected to the Southbound database or not, but it can be a lifesaver if you're trying, you know, banging your head against the wall trying to figure out why something is going wrong. You run that and find out, oh, it's, it's not connected. Oh, that's all. And then same thing for um, a, an OVS DB server. You can check the cluster status for Raft to try to figure out, um, say, who the current leader is, what the, um, you know, the availability of the various servers, and et cetera. So um, hopefully that's helpful for you guys if you're looking to debug OVN. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to the next slide. Hello, I'm Thomas. I'm shortly talking about Network Manager. Network Manager is the configuration tool for the network on RHEL and distributions. So what Network Manager does is to configure the network. But I think the most important job that it has is to pro provide an API for other tools to allow them to do that. In, in that sense, it also allows those tools to integrate with each other because they use the same underlying configuration uh, primitives. Network Manager's API is all about profiles. Profiles are a bunch of settings or descriptive uh, configuration for the network. So you create those profiles and you activate them. Consequently, when you want to look at what is Network Manager doing, you look at the profiles you have and which are active. And you can do that with NMCLI, which is Network Manager's com command line tool. You can say NMCLI connection to list all profiles and you can call NMCLI device to see which are active. But in general, when, when debugging a network issue, I prefer to look at the lower level first because Network Manager is only the component that configures the system. So if you cannot reach or reach a, an IP address or you cannot resolve a name, then it's not Network Manager doing that. It's configured in your system. So I would look at the IP addresses that I have at how is resolver how is the resolve conf con, uh, configured? Or how, like, it also can configure OVS. So I would look how is OVS actually configured? And then I might see, oh, there is no IP address. And in a second step, I would ask, what did Network Manager do? Why is it not as I need it? Or what do I need to change? So I find it more helpful to first look what's the problem. But in general, for really debugging Network Manager, you always need to look at the log file. And unfortunately, the log file by default is not very useful because otherwise it would be much too verbose. So for debugging, you actually need to increase the logging verbosity. And you do that in, in the configuration file of Network Manager. And then look at syslog. Yes, I think that's it. I hand over to the next slide. Thank you. Hi, hi, this is Grace. Yeah, I'm talking about NGMStay for how you use being Teco and how to debug. NGMStay currently is providing the API in a describable way so that you can query your network in a YAML or JSON format. Then you apply the changed desired states to us. And NGMStay will create a checkpoint to make sure your desired states is actually applied to the kernel and user space. If not, we roll back. We also provide the context, which allow you to automatically roll back to all states after, after a timeout. So that means you can try any dangerous network settings without ordering your news collections to this server. Um, NMStay is used in many projects like OpenShift, Over, and BDSM, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And when you have several issues of them, you I think you probably need to gather logs of those projects. And for NMStay to debug the issues, the debug log is sufficient. And in the Python API, you can just define the log level into logging debug, and that's it. And you will get the log in a standard hour or in a way you define the logging facility. And the command line also providing a debug by default in the standard arrow so you can see the issues. The valid interface of an MSTA also includes the debug messages. 
Uh, currently, I'm still using is using Natural Manager as the default backends. So providing the tra tracking level logs of Natural Manager also helps to reproduce and debug the issues. Um, and this for plugins. That means you can use whatever backends you want as long as you provide a plugin to the NMSD. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, eBPF and XDP. Um, I'm not sure that everyone here is familiar with the eBPF concept, so let me spend a few words about what it is. So eBPF is actually a custom bytecode that you can upload to the kernel and attach to certain events in the kernel. And whenever those events happen, your program is executed. Of course, there are some safeguards, so it's very hard for you. The program is verified for safety, so it has to be proven safe before um, it is accepted by the kernel. Uh, but yeah, in general, this is quite powerful concept. Uh, one example of such event that you can attach your program to is reception of a networking packet. And this is called XDP and uh, actually allows manipulation with the packet and passing of the packet and so on, before even the kernel stack sees it. So this uh, <coughs> obviously opens some nice opportunities for acceleration of various um, common tasks. So one typical example would be filtering, like some kind of firewalling. Uh, this might be especially useful for distributed uh, denial of service protection where other software can analyze traffic and when it finds uh, certain patterns that should be blocked, it can configure accordingly a BPF program and will just drop these packets just as soon as they are received from the hardware, um, basically eliminating much of the overhead of the networking, of the current networking stack. Uh, another use case might be load balancing. Again, as soon as packet is received, uh, it might be inspected and redirected elsewhere. So those are some interesting concepts. Uh, in the future, there are probably even more opportunities than this, but those need some work in the kernel first. Um, we might think in a uh, uh, about offloading even parts of the packet switching, yeah, maybe offloading parts of uh, smart or SDN switches to, to XDP. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, a bit different to what everyone uh, was or has been used to. Uh, namely, as I said, with XDP, the packets are uh, received by the program and can be dropped before even the current working stack sees them. Which means that the usual traditional tools like TCP DAM and Wireshark, they just don't see the packets. Or if an XDB program modifies a packet, well, those tools see the packet after the modifications because they are part of the current networking. Uh, luckily, uh, our colleague uh, Elko uh, developed a nice tool called XDP Dump, which is able to uh, observe the packets before XDP programs see them, uh, which actually allows you to see what's going on, whether the packets are dropped by the XDP program or modified by XDP program or whatever happens with them. Uh, so this is probably one of the most important things while debugging XDP that uh, I would highlight, uh, and one uh, and a tool that would prevent many surprises. Uh, now there's uh, also other, there's also BPF tool that's something that's been around for quite a while. Uh, it's getting more and more functions and features. Um, for networking, the probably the most relevant part is BPF tool net, which will helpfully dump all 
BPF programs attached or that are related to networking attached to like networking uh, data path. Uh, now it will only list the programs with uh, the identifiers. There are uh, other comments in BPF tool that I able to dump the whole programs so you can actually get the program, inspect it, uh, and that means both the bytecode and the the cheated uh, machine code uh, of the program because obviously BPF does not interpret the bytecode, it is cheated into the native machine code. So you can dump those programs too. It's not that easy to go through assembly or bytecode, of course, so there's still some work ahead of us to improve this experience. But yeah, I think the basic tools to, to explore what's going on in XDP and BP networking, it's in place already. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really have to admire the coordination and clockwork that we did over here uh, because we had planned for half hour of just three presentations and then the remaining for uh, question and answers kind of things. So. We will open up the forum for question and answers. People can ask uh, questions through the question and answer tab of Hopin, or um, feel free to uh, ask it through the audio channel. I don't know if we can ask the audio channel, but feel free to ask through chat or Q&A tabs of the Hopin session. Uh, we are all here to answer any of the questions that you might have, or share with us what is your biggest debugging problem that you face and maybe we can we have some clues of how to help you right now or if you uh, or if you can't then maybe we can put it on our to-do list and provide a solution in the near future when i had envisioned this session it was more of a bird of a feather kind of a session where people would come and we would help you out by having our experts available and answering your questions. So please don't be shy. All questions are good questions. See, uh, I see uh, some questions in Q&A. Uh, the first one is probably for to me. Uh, do you recommend system type or eBPF based tools? Um, that's not question. Uh, so one thing I didn't mention about BPF is it's not only networking related. It can be used also for for other purposes like tracing. Uh, so basically, you can attach uh, BPF programs uh, in place of some trace points or even like function um, entry or exit, and uh, you can have multiple BPF programs attached to multiple points. Uh, and uh, coordinate uh, the, the tracing between them, uh, which allows you to do things like uh, uh, following a certain structure, for example, when working packet through the various point in the kernel. Uh, now, uh, I would definitely recommend BPF, BPF tracing because uh, it's it's safer system type works in a way that you need to compile the the kernel module load it there are no safeguards there uh, there are uh, you need to have like the, the the development environment for compiling those programs and so on so this should be much easier with tools like bpf trace on the other hand, uh, I have to admit that those tools are still under development and you might encounter some bugs sometimes. So I would probably default to BPF trace and fall back to system tab if I hit, uh, run into some issues. Okay, so the next question is uh, a very broad question, which is a good question till thanks. Uh, how do we debug, how do we what kind of bugs do you find in the telco deployment? I would, this is such a broad question that I would request uh, Dan Williams to answer it from OpenShift containerized platform perspective. And then I'll request Flavio to answer it from OpenStack-ish perspective. So Dan, if you could start, please. Yes, can you hear me?
Okay. Yeah. So a recent uh, customer, had, um, I'll just go through two of them, actually. Uh, one of them turned out to be out of date uh, network interface card firmware that was dropping a certain size of packets. And we only figured that out by having um, a lot of Wireshark dumps of specific traffic through the cluster. Um, so all of the things that we've talked about are great um, and very necessary, but you also need to you know, go back to the basics sometimes and just look at packet captures. Um, and so those Wireshark dumps from uh, multiple interfaces, uh, both physical and virtual ones on the machine itself, and also dumps from the top of rack um, switch that the machines were connected to, allowed us to narrow down the packet drops to somewhere between the kernel driver and the card. And then we figured out by using uh, ETH tool and getting some other info about the card firmware that it was out of date, upgraded that firmware and everything started working. Um, another situation we had uh, was where we saw some very odd TCP uh, streams and those we again used Wireshark to identify those, um, but then we used other tools like NSTAT, uh, NetStat, and uh, some other of those kind of core, much lower level tools that inspect the kernel TCP and UDP stacks to figure out that it was actually a problem in a uh, partner or vendor program that was misusing some of the uh, options for TCP sockets. So those are two examples of uh, specific telco problems that we were able to uh, successfully debug, but we used uh, the normal tools that a lot of people are probably familiar with, Wireshark, uh, some of the lower level things as well, um, and uh, were able to successfully resolve those issues with those tools. And we didn't even, for these escalations, we started at higher levels with things like OVS and OVN, but pretty quickly determined that those were actually not the problem that it was these kind of lower level things with the NIC hardware and some of the vendor programs. Flavio, would you like to tell us from your experience in the yeah. Yeah, well, uh, over the switch can be used in the kernel data path and also with the user space data path. So uh, there are some configurations that don't apply applies to the user space data path and it's a little bit different that people are used to. So you have to reserve CPUs, you have to reserve memory, dedicate CPUs and memory for uh, that specific purpose. And uh, one of the things that we found is uh, sometimes uh, some tweaking here and there can cause problems. And using the, the vSwitch D logs and also uh, the SOS report. So there is this tool called SOS, which generates a report and it captures a lot of data on the host. So you can um, look and review what's going on offline. That's very useful, not only for OVS, but the whole system. And um, still the logs of OVS are there. The, uh, there is a dump of the database there and we could check and find out uh, configuration problems. Um, the other situation uh, was like learning on the fly. So we had a, a, a spurious packet drop. Really, uh, it's, it's not predictable. Uh, it took us some time to troubleshoot that. And we found that it was due to uh, locking contention. And uh, we had to use some instrumented uh, uh, code back then, but then we were able to add uh, an event counter to uh, this particular situation. So if it happens again, we can easily look at the statistics and figure out what the problem is. So, I mean, uh, we, we have a, a large set of tools, but sometimes we need to, uh, to be a little bit creative to find out. And once we find out, we try to increase or try to make it visible from the outside. So we don't need to uh, go over that again. Um, let's see. The, of course, there are, uh, since the, it's a programmable data path and it's becoming harder to follow up what's going on. Uh, we have Prototrace also. Uh, helps us to understand what's going on. So uh, at, at one deployment, we couldn't see the packets go into a port. Uh, we were expecting a packet there, but it wasn't there. So, uh, and if you start doing TCP dump, you have to troubleshoot many uh, software devices, sometimes going inside of network namespaces and whatnot. So it becomes a, a, a tedious 
process, especially if it's in a remote uh, deployment system. Um, well, it, knowing about the package, we could use the OF Proto Trace and find out and, and find out what uh, was going on with it. So it was matching on different fields than expected, and we finally was able we were able to find out what go, was going on. So it, instead of yeah, so it saves a lot of time just by using the tracing tool instead of uh, you know going to the usual path of uh, attaching TCP dumps on all the uh, interesting interfaces. Okay. Uh, thanks, Flavio. Thanks, Dan. Uh, one question that came from the side was, um, do we have any other tools that show a complete network diagram, or at least a static view of the network diagram? And yes, we have a tool for that purpose. Jury Ben's developed it out of necessity, and it's been pretty, pretty popular and pretty helpful. Jerry, would you like to tell us more about Plotnet config, please? So it's a tool that is mostly targeted for for developers and like system integrators, like developers not of just kernel, developers of some lower level solution of deploying some complicated networking setups. And what it does is it scans the the machine and uh, discovers all the networking namespaces and all the interfaces and it talks to OBS and finds uh, what interfaces OBS knows about. Uh, it has some DPDK support and so on. So it basically examine, examines the machine and uh, draws a diagram or plot of uh, all interfaces, namespaces and their interconnections. Awesome. Maybe we can put a link in the chat, uh, Jerry, for the Plotnet config upstream stuff. Thanks. So next question is from Thomas Haller, who's asking, uh, is OBS common in telco more general? What's special about networking in telco environments? OK, again, a broad question. I'll try to attempt to answer it, and other people can fill in. So OBS is not only required for telco. It's like a component for all of our layered products right now. So OpenShift, which is the container platform, and OpenStack, which is the virtualization platform, both of them use OBS. And Rev also, to a certain extent, also uses OBS. So OBS is the switching platform for within the server switching, and it ties into the rest of the cluster as well through OpenFlow and SDN, et cetera, et cetera. So it leverages quite nicely. And um, that is our default solution uh, for packet movement within the server and a little bit beyond. So OBS is being used uh, in our Red Hat products. And then if one of the telcos or one of the big banks or any one of our big customers wants our solution, especially our layered product solutions, then they, by default, use OBN for their packet movement. There are other things, uh, which are like SRIOV, Direct Connect, and a little bit of Linux bridges still being used. But predominantly, we see packets flowing through OBS. And the next question is more general. What is special about networking in telco environments? Yeah, that's a good question. So what's special about them is um, they most of the time, they require low latency. Uh, and there are telco environments are very different also. The requirements for core are more for packet aggregation and packet transport. Uh, between their large data centers. Uh, so they might be looking at uh, 25 gigs or bonded 25 gig links or even 100 gig links, and they want fast packet throughput, path, low latency movement. Then as you go towards the edge, uh, which is maybe a base, uh, at the base station of a large antenna, cellular tower, something like that, then the requirements change a little bit because then they require things like precision time protocol, PTP, uh, ultra low latency, maybe real time uh, kernel to make it predictable. And, um, and then you go to really far edge and the requirements are nest definitely about uh, uh, real, uh, real time with precision timing and connection to GPS satellites for synchronization of packets and time stamping, et cetera. So in a general sense, the requirements from telcos are a little bit varied, 
And we see SRIOV still being deployed. We see um, DPDK on the software path. And slowly, slowly, we are getting more requirements for encryption because, uh, believe it or not, still a lot of packets are flowing in the clear. And that is a security threat because of hackers and other things. So at least the control packets should be encrypted. So IPsec or encryption, uh, packet drops, packet forwarding, switching, all of these are required by that. So some good questions have come in, so let me try to address them. So Till Mass is asking, OBS bonding, OBS support bonding, will it replace, replace kernel bonding or TMD? So again, we don't see that much traction with the team driver. Uh, some people are interested in it and we are evaluating it to see how many people are still interested in it or should we try to deprecate it and or at least put it in maintenance mode because my my usual philosophy is when we have two solutions we have no solution well i learned it from bill nottingham who is uh, who used to be part of the kernel team and now is part of the ansible team so try to minimize confusion try to minimize solutions is one of the things that we strive for is so team driver we have a question mark on its future but the customers are definitely love kernel bonding they know it they love it they know how it works but in some cases they are leaning towards obs bonding as well so i think we will we've in my i mean my point of view or my prediction is that we will continue to see kernel bonding and obs bonding um for the foreseeable future but I don't know much about, I don't know the, what the future of team driver is going to be. Yeah, one interesting to add here is that uh, or in user space data path, there is only uh, OVS bound. Yeah. Yes, good point about user space. Thanks for adding that, Flavia. Next question is from Heidi. We've been supporting projects to improve EPPF mm -hmm. to support better debugging and research. Please contact me if you are interested. Okay, that's more of a statement. Yes, we we are working on multiple fronts on eBPF uh, XDP and especially on eBPF and debugging. Uh, feel free to contact us or ID, and we are working in the research group or the CTO's office, in um, hardware enablement team, and in the networking team. And I hear even on IBM CTO's office and research team. So. There is a lot of activity about eBPF and particularly about debugging and tracing. It is part of the our RHEL, uh, RHEL releases now. It is GA with RHEL, uh, but there are some caveats like, because it's so powerful, we did not want to ship it without root privileges. So you will have to do, you will have to have root privileges to be able to use some of this, which should be okay. When yeah, you are, go ahead. Bill. Yeah, it should be noted that we already have some working relationship within the in the eBPF and XDP area with universities. Uh, Jesper Brower and Tokyo Online, uh, both of those are XDP developers. Uh, they are working extensively with uh, some universities. So this is already taking place, which is great, I think. Okay, awesome. So when Liang asked a question about command line versus that, it has been answered already so which i think in the general answer is when it, it depends on it depends some of them are command line a lot of them are based on command line some of them like plotnet config is uh, visual aid um, i think the tool that is being developed through OpenShift it does have a, 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 a user a user interface component like a gui component and uh, it's going to have things like nodes and, and, and network diagrams and, and uh, double click to find out more information and color coding if a node is down. That's what I hear. I don't know the particulars, but there are different tools for different purposes. But predominantly right now, as with everything else, mostly they are based on command line. The question was specifically about OVM trace, it seems to me. Okay. So there's still 40 plus people on the call. Um, I am sure you have other questions. 
So please don't be shy. We have 10 more minutes. We are trying to post the slides, um, but slides should be posted shortly. And there are uh, links in there that you can use for further exploration. And you have the names of all the all of our uh, names on the first slide. Please feel free to reach out directly or indirectly. And if you have questions afterwards also, and we'll try our best to help resolve them. Anybody else has any questions? Is there any activity in the chat? I haven't been looking at that. I did not know I was echoing badly. Sorry about that. Is the echo still? I'm hearing fine. Sorry if I was caught in causing the echo. Apologies. Sure, Gris is uh, requesting that uh, maybe we can add a slide for the contact information. I'll, I'll do that. If Flavio hasn't uploaded already, then maybe we should add that slide then. Sure, good idea, Chris. Some people are getting an echo and apologies for that, others are not. I don't have a double connection. I, I'm not connected twice, so I'm not sure where the echo is coming from. I see Jesper has joined also. Jesper, would you like to say something about eBPF XTP uh, with regards to debugging at least? It's okay if you, if you are fine. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you work in eBPF XTP a lot also. You just wanted to give you a chance. Yeah. I. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, I was with with. I just had a, uh, some some chats with with people, and people are asking how how can how can we get the the feature features out of like we just ship a red rail kernel, right? But we backport all our features, and people don't understand what kind of BPF features are available in, in different kernel releases. Uh, so. I can answer the, the question myself because I've had this chat with people, uh, but there's actually the BPF tool have have a, a sub command that is called features, and you can actually use that to dump the different features. Um, but then then people came back to me and said, "But then I have to install Red Hat first to dump the features. Can't you provide these feature dumps per per release?" So I'm thinking maybe we should do that. So was this asked inside the open or was it on an external? Uh, this was on on the, I think it was on some Slack channel. I think it's the Cilium Slack channel, but it's not, wasn't related to the, but I had two, two, two different, one yesterday and one today asking and misunderstanding saying, oh, we cannot do this on real. So yes, we can, we can actually do it on real. Yeah, so, we, so. We, we have a list of uh, the, of the uh, types of programs that we support with 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 uh, releases uh, but i guess they are asking for more like even what helpers are available or what's even more granular features right yeah and they wanted they wanted some web page they could they could access um with the features do we have that i don't think so and honestly, with the speed of development of uh, eBPF and uh, the speed of us backporting the features, it would be very hard to maintain. Uh, yeah, exactly. That was so, that was also also my problem with it. So I asked them directly, would they be fine with if we just like boot the kernel, dump the features, <laughs> and then provide that as a output? They were happy about that. So what we can provide probably is uh, is a mapping of rel 
releases to upstream kernel versions, saying like in real kernel 8.3, we support features from the upstream kernel up to 5.7, stuff like that. I think I think it might be useful still. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But so we have I, ideas. I was I was thinking about like I put in the chat now. You can just run this command, and you will basically get all what's supported. If you have to boot the kernel, and you, we could just provide that for for download somewhere. That would be like zero effort from from us, and people can actually check all the details they want. Sounds good. I'll I'll draft up an email with the suggestion. Awesome. So we have about four minutes left. Um, if there are other questions or comments, we are still here for four minutes. So how many people are on this session who were in person in DevConf last year? Just curious. I think uh, many of us on this, at least the presenters were, many of the presenters were there. I was there. I tried to create a poll, but I cannot create a poll. <laughs> Last year, I attended a session which was uh, in depth on Verno for the time, which was candy exchange. <laughs> so people from all over the world brought candy and they exchanged it. And some of it was just amazing wonderful there's a whole culture i found out in sweden i think where they have these spicy candies and they love them and they were some of them were like whoa spicy like i couldn't even handle them uh, i mean at least i couldn't handle them but other people were enjoying it but my point is devconf is a lot of fun and there are there are these side tracks of uh, side sessions like candy exchange and other things which are quite enjoyable I'm gonna, hopefully we don't have uh, COVID next year <laughs> and we have an in-person dev comp and I'm gonna try my best to attend these side stuff also. There's, there's two polls now. Yeah, so you have have yes, thank you. Okay, two polls. I was there, yes. Okay, cool. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. We will upload the slides with an added slide with the contact information. And uh, Nicola and Jerry, uh, Jerry Danik, very, thank you very much for being such nice hosts. The interface was awesome. I'm going to send more feedback to the organizers. It was very seamless and we loved it. Thank you very yeah. much.